welcome everybody today to the Book and Life podcast with your host, Crystal Fleming. Today we are going to be talking to a sensational non-fiction writer, and she also does mysteries set in the Appalachian Mountains, just to whet your appetite. She's an incredible woman, and I can't wait to share this story with you. But first, before we get started, I need to read this quick, short time uh, advert. So here we go. The Shadow Time Guardian Series Book 4 by Marianne Curley. The batter is the battle is over, the war is won, the prophecy complete. The life can't just pick up where it left off for Ethan. Struggling to cope with tragic loss at odds with friends in the guard, he finds himself adrift, jumping at shadows and sensing someone who can't possibly be there. Blaming herself for the goddess Athena's death, Giselle screws revenge and vilify the immortal's plan for world domination. But Giselle hadn't planned on love. And that leaves her with an unbearable choice. Should she follow her heart or the strings of a goddess short on praise but high on expectation? Who continues to pull her from the grave? As the guard and the order battle through the past and into their possible future, darkness lurks around every corner. The fight for the world's survival rests with just one. Is it friend or foe who stands in the shadow? One of her favorite, one of the uh, books is up right now for. Um, the U- U- the Ukraine crisis is called The Price of Freedom by Rosemary Rowan and it's a Roman British series and again the title is The Price of Freedom and her agent has sent her commission um, for the fund as well so if you've got a spare pound or two make sure you pick up the book just to support the Ukraine crisis and uh, yeah now let's welcome a very special guest to the show and let's welcome Linda McDaniel. So it is lovely to have you on. I am hoping I said your name right. Uh, I'm terrible with pronunciation of names, so I apologize now. But it is great to have you on. And I was excited about having you on because, funnily enough, when I was looking you up, I love the fact that you've written articles for such a, a wide range of different things from Southern Living, Country Living, you go all the way through to, you know, restaurants and you need big newspapers and stuff like that. So I thought that you were a very interesting writer. I love the, the series that you, you're you doing. Um, it just came across as a really awesome series and very interesting. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I was very much looking forward to sitting down and talking to you today. And also you, you live in... in uh, North Carolina, which is one of my favorite states, because I have a few friends that live in that area, um, a few wrestling friends that lives in that area. So yeah, I, I it just made me more excited about about sitting down and talking with you today. So first of all, could you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your series? And I've been writing forever. Um, as you mentioned, I I wrote um, a lot of magazine articles. About, I quit counting after 1,200. This was back in the day when, um, you know, magazines were different from today. At least in the States, we, um, magazines are harder and harder to write for now. And so I, I feel very lucky that I got to do that. And I did. I wrote about nature to art. I, I wrote a lot about art. But I'll tell you, always in the back of my mind, it's hard writing for editors. Uh, by the very nature of their job, they're supposed to find fault with what you wrote. And it gets old, you know? It's like, well, this was my approach. If you had wanted me to write your approach, you should have told me what that was. So it wasn't always uh, comfortable or to put your heart and soul into an article, and then the editor, she should have said, I wanted you to take this angle, and I would have done that. But she leaves it to you. So there's a saying amongst us writers that um, you don't know what an editor wants until you find out what she doesn't want. And so it was, um, it, it was a good time in my life, but when I decided to 
just take a leap and write fiction. I, I just can't tell you how thrilling that was to write exactly what I wanted to write. I was editing it, and, and I did some nonfiction too, some nonfiction books about writing and about nature. That um, you know, I could just do what I wanted to do, and that's been the past 15. Years and I've really enjoyed that. So uh, my fiction series is, is like my heart and soul. I, I put everything I've got into it. It does uh, cover the years, so to speak. I mean, it's inspired by the years I spent in North Carolina in Appalachia. And yeah. uh, it was eye opening, life changing, uh, sometimes so hard it made me. But I look back on that, and it was just like birthing tears or whatever. I, I I just learned so much, and I became who I really am instead of what my parents thought I should be. So, um, so this series is now I'm I'm working on the eighth book. It's, wow. Yeah. Wait. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a prequel, which is pretty short little novella. But uh, it's just a prequel. I'm currently working on the eighth book in the series. And uh, also simultaneously, I've never done this before, but I'm working on the ninth book as well. And wow. so uh, I'll tell you about those later. But that, that's what the, the stories were inspired by the mountain people that I met. And I don't know if you, you know about that, this, but in America, Appalachia has always had um, a stigma to it. Uh, people look down on some of the mountain people. Well, my experience was just the opposite. It was, oh, sure, I met jerks there, just like I meet jerks anywhere, you know, so it's not like they're perfect. But a lot of the people are lovely, lovely people, and they taught me so much about generosity and honesty and art and craft. It's a, a region rich in that and music. So it was an uplifting time for me and I put that into mysteries. These are all mysteries because I'm just addicted to, to mysteries and uh, love them. And so it's a, it's a real pleasure to write and um, spend time with my imaginary friends. They were a godsend during the lockdown. And um, so it, it's, uh, I'm very happy with the time I spend writing. I love that you said that they were, you know, it was great for during lockdown. I had two lockdowns, so I know, I know the pressures of that. Um, and it, it is hard. Did you find that lockdown sort of had an impact on your writing and an impact on what you did or not so much? You know, not so much. I, I'm, I'm relatively introverted anyway. And so I um, just kept doing what I always do. Now, I mean, I miss the, the just getting out and going to a coffee shop. I miss, uh, you know, seeing people or going to uh, things, even, you know, social things that are like where there's too many people and so they couldn't meet and that kind of thing. But uh, as far as my day to day life, it didn't feel all that different. Yeah. For me, it was just uh, getting used to being at home with my mom <laughs> and learning how to write around her and her crazy schedule and people coming and going and not understanding that if a writer's got her headphones on and her fingers are going like mad, don't interrupt it. Just leave her alone. She, you know, she needs to write. Um, so those were my big struggles. And, and it's so funny that you say that because sometimes we need those imaginary friends more than people would ever realize because times has really been hard for everybody these last two years so it's nice to hear that there's other somebody else who's had you know an imaginary friend that's gotten them through it and, um 
you know, and I think we're realizing as a society how important our homes are because here we are spent two years pretty much stuck in our homes. So, you know, I think we're all kind of appreciating the extra space and the extra bit of, you know, movability and, and that maybe some, t some people are realizing flats aren't for them or realizing that maybe their house is a bit too big for them and, you know, they need to get somewhere smaller. So I think it's... I think it's been very beneficial as well as being a very interesting experience. Um, that's for certain. So, you were talking about being up there and meeting the people and being able to write it as a mystery. Did you think about writing any other, like, these stories in any other genre? Or was it just an instant, it has to be a mystery, I can't put it in any other genre? Yeah, the latter. I, I, I just like mysteries. I, um, I feel like a bit of a Philistine saying this, but I'm not that keen on literary writing because I miss the whodunit. You know, I miss that yeah. something happening that's drawing me into each page. Whereas when it's uh, more literary, I, I mean, if it's beautiful writing, that's one thing, but uh, it doesn't have that pull me into it factor. So I never even considered anything else. In fact, I was thinking, well, gosh, do, do I always want to write mysteries? And it's, it's not that I wouldn't want to write something else, but I just, I just don't think I would find that suspense and that draw that I get from mysteries. Very true. I could see you doing a thriller, though. Something tells me you could do a really good thriller. <laughs> well, I consider it, I mean, even though it's a different genre, but I consider it similar in, in that vein of like, oh, what's going to happen next? You know, so yeah, I yeah. guess I could do that. <laughs> I, I just, I always, I always pictured you writing this really good thriller and all of us sitting around the sort of campfire as you read the first chapter to us all and we're, we're all just we're there the next morning you come out we're all still reading you know, under the stars with all little torches and stuff so yeah I, I don't know why but when I started reading about you that was the instant uh, little picture I had in my head so yeah that, that's a good idea for uh, a nice little book launch you know hire somewhere <laughs> nice and just invite people up they just rent a room and you know they can get the book before anybody else i think that's that's a lovely oh, yeah, that idea so you're on the sixth book now most people will be saying wow that that's something to take on was six books planned or was it just a case of you wrote the first one and then it kind of snowballed again the latter uh I really didn't think anybody would would read my first book. I, I, it was in the process uh, for 15 years because of, I guess, lack of self-confidence. So to all those writers out there who are maybe struggling in the same way, just don't listen to that stuff, you know? Uh, yeah. Just do it. And I did it, and I put it out there, and now there wasn't a twist to it. Della, there's two characters. Della is someone sort of like me. She's a former journalist, and she now owns a country store, and uh, she moved to the mountains. She's not a native. And then Abbott Bradshaw is um, a young man in the first book who's struggling to find who he is. He's, he's got some learning disabilities, they think. Um, okay. So... Um, Anyway, uh, I didn't know if anybody would would enjoy this, but what I found out is they absolutely loved Abbott. So I just lowered Della, who was me, I swallowed my ego and let her play a lesser role. And Abbott is now the star of every book that follows. And I, I see reviews on Amazon that say, you know, I could read anything that Abbott's in because people just, and I don't know, he just showed up one day and I don't know where he came from. He's obviously a composite of me. Uh, yeah. I am in there as far as um, he 
has a, a real, uh, you know, he's trying to find his place in the world and what's okay to do and what's not okay to do and all that. But he's also just a new friend. I, I don't know where he came from, but he certainly has captured the hearts of some readers. And so now, uh, to, to get back to your original question, I thought that first book was going to be it. And then, yeah. like I said, I liked playing with my imaginary friends, and gee whiz, they liked Abbott. So he stars in the next book. Nicholas in it, but it's only his voice. They share voices yeah. in all the other books, but um, he's the only voice and point of view in the second book. And um, so it just evolved from there. I like that. I do. I like that. So how did you find writing sort of the, I always say the stru the hard bits like the policing and the procedural parts? Did you did that come easy to you, or, you know, was that a bit more of a struggle? Well, I cheated because I it would have been very hard to me, and I'm not. The I love type that, that you cheated. <laughs> and I'm. I'm not the type to call up the local police department and say, hey, can you help me out here? So I just made sure that everything was as deep as I could go without major research, but it's it's in no way a procedural. Um, yeah. So there's um, good cops and bad cops, and um, but there it's all that part's pretty um, unimportant. It, well, I wouldn't say unimportant, but it's, it's those characters don't have starring roles. No, at their minimum is what you're saying. Their minimum mm -hmm. starage, yeah. Well, that that makes sense. I actually, for mine, went and got a retired detective. Good for you. And harassed him periodically, and I went. I uh, started off with, "Can I donate the book to you?" And then it was like, "Can I ask you this? Could you read this? Could you let me know what you think of that?" So yeah, bless him. He's uh, I think he's tired of hearing from me. So, well, but it was good. I it was good because I wanted to, to make sure it so. was exactly how he would handle the investigation. So it's it's I I feel it's important. I or at least I thought it was important. So yeah. Sure. Uh, so, so could you tell us a little bit about your current release and? Uh, what do you find the most exciting about Deep in the Forest? No, sorry, Up the Creek. You got it right. Up the Creek, you. yeah. It just came out June 9th, so, or June 7th, so you, you yeah. can be excused. It's, it's a brand new one. So, um, well, let's see. Um, if just as an aside, uh, you mentioned Deep in the Forest, and, and that one's actually set in England. And, and a wee bit in Ireland, but um, that was a, yeah. a divergence for me. But um, anyway, uh, Up the Creek is back in Appalachia, and um, Abbott finds uh, a man uh, almost near death in the creek that runs along his property line. And um, the thing I really enjoyed developing was taking his He's an innately kind person, but of course he struggles with when's it good to be kind and when do you have to be a little tougher. And so he struggles with that. But throughout the book, uh, the man has amnesia, which is just a great tool. I loved it. I just loved using that. You know, it's an old uh, um, tool for writers and screenwriters and everything. And I can see why, because it's just delicious. You, you can... You can have anything happen because this guy doesn't remember who he is. And yeah. so gradually he does, and Abbott's uh, suspicions and concerns are assuaged. And um, I don't want to say too much, but um, they come to understand one another. And that's really the mystery. I mean, there is yeah. some mystery about how did he get in such bad shape, but the overriding mystery is who is this guy? Is he good? Is he bad? And what will he mean to Abbott's life? And yeah. um, I enjoyed that immensely. And, and could you 
could you tell us a little bit about your upcoming release? Because you've got one, as you said, you're working on the uh, seventh. It'll be the seventh book release. Yeah. Um, so oh, I, I've lost. I think it's counting the prequel. It's the eighth and ninth. And right. um, the eighth book is going to be a, a Christmas novella. And oh, that's cool. it, yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to be maybe it, it's got a mystery. Um, Abbott is a woodworker, and his son, who's by now, um, all the books have aged. You know, each person. I mean, they they yeah. chronologically aged. So Abbott is now forty, instead of fifteen when we first met him, and he has his own family, two boys, and his older older boy has um, asked for him to make him a dresser, and Abbott. You know, he has to pay the bills, and he's making all these woodworking things for clients, and he keeps putting his son off, and he feels bad about it, so he buys a second-hand one and refinishes it. And when he's working on it, he finds that one of the drawers in the dresser has a false bottom, and a diary huh? falls out. And it's a very old diary. I, I, I think it's like... 50 years old, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, it could be uh, uh, more like 30 years old. But it's got some revelations in it that have, like the world didn't know uh, about somebody's father. And so Abbott and Della go snooping to find out, you know, what happened? What's the story behind all this? And there's no murder, there's no big crime, but um, there is a mystery. And, um, and then there's some other things, some character development that happened where some loose ends are tied up and some nice things happen. You know, it's Christmas after all. And yeah, so of course. Uh, I'm going to enjoy working on that. And then the next book, which will come out not simultaneously, but very close, which is unusual. I don't usually do that. But I, one of my readers mentioned... Um, that I should write a cookbook based on the food that's in the uh, series. And I hadn't realized how much I wrote about food, but uh, I've had a lot of readers say, boy, you really must like food because it's always in your books. And, and I thought, well, who doesn't like food? And yeah, I do. And so I do that I, myself. So yeah, but that, yeah. That's, that's my cheat. That's my cheat to remind me to eat. It's not that I love food, it's like, right, okay, if I write a meal here, I can take a break and go and actually eat something. So it's more of a okay. reminder for me. And I have to keep reminding the readers that us as writers, we have to almost sit down and put in meals, bed, so that we remember to go do these things ourselves. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Yeah, I, I don't have that problem. I've never missed a meal. And... Um... Nothing. Yeah, I, I Nothing do that if I'm be... really into a book. If I'm really into writing it, Is everything right? goes out the window. I'll forget to feed the cats. I'll forget to go to bed. I will literally get dragged through by my husband kicking and screaming. Uh, I'm awful. I'm awful when I'm really in a book. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's why I do it. But I do know f quite a few authors that do it. Ones that really disappear into the writing. <laughs> will actually write a schedule into their books just so that it reminds them to do these things. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, and I'm grateful that I do it now because it, it does help. It does help to remind myself to eat, sleep, wash, <laughs> repeat well, kind of thing. So, yeah. It's a nice thing to include in a book, too. You know, details that the readers can relate to. And um, I... Uh, when this... So this um, reader said, you should write a cookbook. And I, I started exploring and researching what, what other authors have done with cookbooks. And so I, I've come up with this composite of recipes from each book. There'll probably be two or three recipes from each book and um, some essays. Mm -hmm. as well as um, the excerpt from that book where the food is mentioned. 
Yeah. And then I'm going to write two or three original short stories that are interspersed. So it's it's a cookbook of sorts. It's a short story book of, of sorts. And I think it's going to be very uh, interesting. Yeah. And uh, so I'll certainly enjoy uh, making it and, and re researching it, getting my recipes down right, practicing. So... Yeah. Uh, that's both of the two I'm, I'm currently working on, and um, I'm also making an audio book of the first book. Uh, the, um, How are you finding that? Oh, it's, it's a lot of work and a fair amount of money. I was fortunate. I have my I have an, uh, two neighbors who are uh, man and wife, and and they uh, are professional actors. And oh, okay. boy, have they brought the book to life. So I hired them to read the, the book, and they have really, really brought it to life. But the only problem is, like, I had to learn how to do all the editing on Audacity. And I did a pretty good job the first time through, but as you can imagine, by the time you get through 68 chapters, you've learned a lot. So now I'm in the process of going back through and making it even better. And so it's pretty laborious. But it is, oh it's, my gosh, yeah. to hear my words spoken alive like that, it's thrilling. And it is, so yeah, it is. Uh, that's really kept me busy this spring. It's beautiful, yeah. I, lo I, I love to hear when people are putting that effort in and are learning because authors, we actually learn all the time because we have to learn about how to read the markets and we have to learn about grammar we have to learn about how you put together the story and the character development process we're constantly we're constant students because we're constantly learning about the industry we love and that we like adding to and we like supporting so i think it's great I, and i like to share that with the listeners saying hey you know this is somebody else who's learning new skills that are going to help you as a reader have a better enjoyment of her work. So uh, I take my hat off to you and I'm glad to hear hear about this journey that you're taking. I think it's incredible. Well, and then we have to learn all about marketing. That was a big surprise to, yeah. to realize how much we have to, to be clever and um, up to date and know the trends and um, it's my least favorite part. I mean, that's pretty common. Every I don't know anybody who loves it, but um, but we do it, don't we? Yeah, we have to. It's it's uh it's what's expected, I think, more than anything else. So you know. So so moving on into uh the book portion of the the podcast. And really looking at us as readers, because every author, we do read a lot, we read each other's material, we are a very uplifting community. So what book have you read recently that you would say has stuck with you the most? The one that, that you've read that's just imprinted itself on you? Well, this book... Um, I had to look it up because it, I read it just, I, I read it recently. Um, it's called Rubbernecker by Belinda Bauer, B-A-U-E-R. Okay. And oh my gosh, it is so creatively set up. I, I've read so many mysteries where, okay, there's a crime, then the police come in, and then they have trouble at home. They're husband thinks they're never home enough and then they they encounter some complications but lo and behold they solve it you know well I've read so many of them that not too many hold my interest anymore I need more character development I need to know about that police person instead of just um, his or her role as a uh, police officer well, this book is just amazing. Um, it's it's about a, a, a student with uh, Asperger's. And so that right there, I mean, I, I, I would imagine you have to have some personal experience with that 
in order yeah. to understand how to write about it because it's so mystifying and unusual uh, to at least to me and um, he is very meticulous and so he is very good at um, things like technical things and things that uh, require that side of his brain and so he goes to school to become an autopsy person and yeah. He doesn't want to be a doctor, so he would be more like a technician, I suppose, or an, a lab assistant or that kind of thing. And while he's uh, doing all this, and of course there's all this character development of how differently he sees the world, it's beautifully written too. I mean, her words are just wonderful. And he, uh, he discovers that in an autopsy, People miss something. The, the lead uh, medical examiner and the people in the classroom that lead the classes missed something, but they won't believe him because they just think he's a weirdo. And yeah. uh, lo and behold, uh, well, I don't want to give too much away, but he prevailed. And yeah. I just thought, what a fabulous premise for a book instead of it just is. crime, complications, solved. You know, and um, it's beautifully written. It has like many uplifting parts, but also some very sad parts. Um, his uh, mother, as you can imagine, has a great deal of difficulty dealing with this difficult child and then a, a teenager and young adult as he ages. So there's a whole lot going on in this book. and. I discovered it. I, I don't know if you do this or not, but I, I, I join these promotional sites that um, give away books free or 99 cents um, yeah. or whatever. And I have to admit, most of them seem like that they're not very good. And But I always, you know, hope springs eternal. And oh my gosh, was I rewarded with this one. And I, le I read about her. She's a screenwriter. I often like books by screen screenwriters because they really know how to tell a visual story. And yep. uh, this was visual and fun and sad and poignant and um, in the end, very uplifting. In fact, the ending is, I won't give it away, but it is just so... Um, well, if I can say it, it's real kick-ass. I mean, it is just <laughs> one of those endings where you just go, woo-hoo, that was, that was really good. That, that's yeah. what you want to hear about books. You want to hear that excitement and love for them. And, and you know, I'm on a lot of ARCs uh, lists, so I get a lot of books before they're released. And sometimes I will have to muddle through some, and then other ones I'm like, oh, Thank goodness, this is amazing. I, you know, this is exactly what I want to read. So yeah, I understand that um, desire to find the right one and to tap into it. So if you had endless amount of time and, you know, this is your free time and you wish, you know, you could just sit and you can read, you get to pick one author and one series that you can read from start to finish, everything they've written, who would the author be and which series would you pick? Well, I'm just an unabashed fan of Michael Connolly. He's an American okay. journalist. He was a crime journalist who became um, a fabulous novelist. And I have read some of those books three times. Like when I go through a period of not being able to find a good book that I can really sink my teeth in. I just go back and like, he's written like probably a hundred novels. So I just go yeah. back to an early one that my poor old brain has forgotten most of the story. And um, I just enjoy it all over again. And I just can't wait for his new releases. Now, the one that I really enjoy are the, is the Bosch series. That's the, um, yeah. the, the guy's last name. And, um, but I like the Lincoln Lawyer series, the Mickey Haller series. I, I'm not as big a fan of the one, um, oh, I can't even remember the Jack, 
um, oh, he's a he's a journalist, and I usually love books about like where the protagonist is a journalist. But right. those are okay. I like them. I I read them again, but um, not not as much as those first two. And okay. my the number one would be Bosch, and and then Mickey Howard. Howard, yeah. Okay. So, So that, that's that's what I would do if I were had miraculously had tons of free time. I know, I know the feeling when you say that. Is there an author, past and present, who's influenced and inspired you to be excited about a writing and b books? Yes, I I have to say, uh, P. D. James is uh, my mentor. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Those books, especially when she wrote them, they to me they were literary. That they were so beautifully written, and they uh, just had intricate plots. I love Malcolm Dogley's. Um, just oh no, Adam. I'm sorry, Adam Dogley. Uh, Malcolm is a musician. Um, Adam Dogley. I, I just thought. And I, I read, I wrote, I read those decades before I got up the nerve to write my own. And right. she, it was always in the back of my mind, like, oh, if I could write like P.D. James. Now, I don't write like P.D. James. I think she's a much better writer than I am. But she, she really, really inspired me. And I've read, I guess, just about everything. I wasn't as crazy about the Jane Austen um, spin-off that she did, but um, I still, I just loved everything that she wrote, and uh, I miss her, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have an author like that myself, uh, Rachel Kane. She passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, same thing. I could not love her stuff more than I did. It was just like coming home and putting on your favorite pair of slippers she just you just sank easily into her worlds and into her storylines and her worlds just sort of you know it was like walking in through a bubble the next thing you know you were just swept away inside of it so um yeah i i understand uh i understand what you mean when you say that so yeah um <clears throat> So when you go to a bookstore, or if you're looking at a bookstore online, what genre do you feel drawn to the most? Well, obviously mysteries, I, they just hold my interest. But I also, there's some nonfiction books. I'm um, uh, home and garden type things. I'm, I'm quite the homebody, quite the um, amateur Martha Stewart. Or, or as I read in a book, um, the, it, it, somebody wrote, the room looked like it was decorated by Martha Stewart's less talented sister. <laughs> That's me. I like you that. Know, I, That's like those, I like those nice things. I don't have her panache for all those things, but I like, yeah. you know, a home to feel nice and um, I like to cook. And, and so I look at cookbooks. I, mean, I have so many and and frankly, I, it's so easy to find recipes online, uh, much easier yeah, than is. looking in indices to try to find that recipe you, you love. Um, so, um, but I, I look at cookbooks and, and craft books and uh, decorating books and gar oh, gardening. I, I, um, I just have a small garden, but uh, I like to get ideas for it. So there, that yeah, was, you, that you like to about it, yeah. Book. Yeah. No, I, I get that. I'm, I'm, you know, my mother and my mother-in-law the same. They have gardens that they putter around in, and they, you know, they they spend a lot of time in there. And, and I just sometimes say to myself, oh, I wish I could do that, but I just don't have the uh, the energy to do it. I, and I don't know where they get all the energy to to do all that uh, on top of everything else. So, yeah, I think it's a, a good testament to uh, the wonders that they, you know, that they can achieve. Has there ever been a book that you've picked up and you just wished 
that you'd never started it or you'd never tried it? Oh, gosh. You know, not, one doesn't come to mind, but I, I do recall an experience where I, I read a book and I, I don't even recall who it was by, but I was so appalled by it that it was so dark and so gruesome and, and, and you know, there's a place for that. There's people who enjoy that. I don't fault that, but I do fault an author who kind of lets it sneak up on you. It's not like you yeah. know you're going to, you're reading that kind of book. And all of a yeah. sudden you're into the story. So you kind of want to find out what happens, but it's so violent and so uh, mean spirited. Uh, I remember once I don't read, I don't leave bad reviews anymore I guess because I hate getting them but yeah of um, course. <laughs> but it's also um, unless it's something that that really does seem wrong with the book I wouldn't do that because there's so many different tastes and who am I to say it's a bad book because of that but I do remember I dashed off a, just a grief-stricken review because I felt that this book was was wrong you know, it should have alerted me to that it was this kind of book or something like that. But that was ages ago, and now I would just toss it aside or, or click and delete it from my library. Um, yeah, I, I so think no, it's... I don't, I don't remember a book other than, like, that experience. Yeah, I think, I think we all have that, whereas I have a tendency not to read blurbs. So sometimes it's my own fault because I should have read the blurb and I didn't and I'm like okay I should have looked before I started reading this one obviously um but sometimes not reading the blurb actually kind of gives you a nice little uh a little experience because you you're almost totally blind to what you're reading and it it allows you to just sort of enjoy finding out what's happened as you go along and yeah, I really, I liked that. I really did. And I thought that was a lot of, a lot of fun. And uh, so I, I, I know what it's like to get caught. I mean, you think, oh, how yeah. silly was I not reading that? But yeah. So moving on into your, into the writing portion of the podcast, we're going to kind of dig into, you know, what writing you used for your series, what writing you know, the, these are the, the conversations and the topics that really help a lot of writers out there who are essentially trying to find their confidence, they're trying to find themselves, and they're trying to work out, you know, um, how this is going to go. So, uh, let's get into it. How did you go about creating the obstacles that you did for your book? What, how was the journey for you like how did you set up that atmosphere so you could write it you know I I came to writing fiction very late in my career and so I had already learned the basic skills of storytelling um, I, I think the best place to go is to understand the structure of storytelling and that's your, you've got to hook your readers, and then you've got to develop characters, and along the way you interject complications that put them to the test, and then you have some resolution. You can have resolution midway of a few things, but then the main problem still continues. I find that very satisfying to read and write where there's some resolution midway so that readers kind of go, oh, that's nice. Yeah, but what about such and such? And so then the story continues. And then, of course, you have your denouement and your ending. And the storytelling yeah. structure will, will guide you. And, and if you just look at that basic outline of what I just said, then you'll know, oh, you know, I didn't really hook my readers or... Gosh, I haven't told them enough about my characters. And then, of course, the all-important complications and conflict. Uh, they just have to be, the story has to be peppered with those. Uh, yeah. One big one, some smaller ones. And so I think 
that simplifies things. You, you're not starting from scratch. You're not like, oh my gosh, I could write anything in the whole universe. You've got your your story outline. I mean, um, well, I guess it's an outline of sorts, but your your story steps. You've got and, peaks and your your downs, yeah. Yeah, and and then 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 you have something that you can that's doable instead of like, oh my gosh, I could write about anything. And and then you just let, I, I'm a big believer in the muse and I don't think that she is just something that shows up to talented writers. The muse is there if we listen and allow. So I believe in writing really bad first drafts because that's what everybody writes anyway. And I, I, I've learned to honor that because getting that first draft down is, um, it is not a creative process. It is more of a left brain process that you're, you're dumping this information and don't expect it to be good. It's like if you were a painter it, and, and you know, they don't paint this way, but let's just say you're a finger painter. So you get a whole lot of paint in different colors down on the canvas. And then the creative starts where you're moving your fingers around and making this more red and that more blue. But, but when you first start writing, you're really just dumping onto the canvas. And so allow yourself to be bad. I have a saying, when I used to teach writing, I coach book writing now, but I don't teach it like in, in classes. And, but when I did, I had an expression that people really liked, and that is, good writing is really good editing. Bad writers just stop too soon. So <laughs> you, you get those words down, and then you edit, 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 edit. But how lovely, because you have your palette there. You have everything there. I mean, virtually everything. You can add to it, but you have it there. The heat's off. You've, you've got it. But then you make it better and better and better with editing. And if you stop too soon, it's not so good. But if you keep editing, and my key on when I'm through editing is when I start making things go back to previous iteration, then I know I'm just messing with it now. So you'll, you'll, you'll come to trust the muse and the editing, and then you let it rest. And you go away and you walk in nature, you walk your dog, you, you do, you sleep, you, you do other things. And I guarantee you, the muse will come back and say, you know, chapter four really needs some more. And so then I go back and do so that's my process. It's just dump, edit, rest, listen, repeat. Except I like that. Dump. Sounds like a, a great plan. Yeah, it works. It's it's just and you know what works about it is the pressure is off. You you don't need to berate yourself. You're not a bad writer. Not you, I mean I'm speaking to the general population here. Um, of course, yeah. You, you, um, you, you just do this. It's it's like, it's just the process, and it's very open to creativity, and it welcomes new ideas. So it's not a rigid outline or anything, unless that works for you. It didn't ever work for me, but if if you if you like an outline, that's fine too. But yeah. um, you just. Just let it evolve and give it the time it needs to evolve. I, I get so upset with these things online about write a book in a month. Okay, well, dump in a month. I get that. But the implication is that you would have a finished product after a month. No. Spend the month dumping and then edit, 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 yeah. edit, edit. I think I think a lot of those um, things that you're talking about really is about just getting words on the page. It's not about having a fully, you know, a full print, you know, print book, uh, you know, publishing ready book. It's um, it's about getting the words down. 
it's about you know constructing your day so you, you're more disciplined so that you're constantly got a target to reach for every day so that you're not waffling I suppose is, is the better way of putting it um and I, I can understand that. I can understand why why a lot of people would find that helpful. I also think it's it's kind of bad for some people because it, it really acts like a, a, you know, a sort of albatross around their necks because they're like, oh, well, yeah, I really need to, really need to go on and do 2,000 words today or I need to do 15,000 words today. I, I can understand why people would struggle with it. Um... So I agree with you in that regard, but I, I do know that 90% of it is just because they're hoping to kind of teach people to get themselves in a very strict um, regimen and, you know, make the make them have a regimen that allows them to get 50,000 uh, words down in a month. Um, you know, so I get it. I do, I get it. Yeah, whatever works for you. I mean, I, I, I do know that that is what, what Nano is for and, and what, what a lot of these sites are for. Um, it is just a case of trying to encourage the writer to keep going and to keep doing what they're doing. Um, but no, I, I, I like how what you're saying, though. And I like the idea that, you know, the way that you've put it together. I think that's... It's lovely to hear that, and it's lovely to hear um, somebody else's view and opinion. What inspired you to enter the different genres with your own writing voice that you did? Was there anything that particularly drew you to those areas? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm strictly in mystery. Um, well, I, and... I was meaning because you, you spent some time writing non-fiction oh yeah and you spent time writing articles was there any reason that you know you chose to write them was there like a, a draw towards it a aha moment oh, or what yeah, was the what attraction is maybe the way, better way of putting it what was the attraction to doing those genres like the writing articles and the non non-fiction well, I knew I wanted to have a writing career, and right. frankly, uh, it was the only way I could imagine earning a living from writing. Um, oh, okay. I wasn't clever enough to be like a um, uh, ad writer kind of person, but right. I felt like I could bring creativity to my nonfiction articles. I also felt like I could... Uh, reach the readers by telling them more about this person rather than just what this person does kind of get inside their head a little bit i guess and that really was great prep work for writing character development in novels so i'm you know just prosaically it was to earn a living and that was the only way i could see articles and non-fiction books uh could could do, you know, is to contribute to my income. And then, uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, I just grew weary of writing for other people. And uh, I went out on a limb and the coaching also augments my income. And so yeah. between all that, I'm able to, to pull together a, a livelihood. It's, you know, I don't know too many average, right, you know, everyday writers who are getting rich but it, it's a it's a good life and it I, is a good life yeah it. yeah when you're when you're writing your your mysteries is it like a jigsaw puzzle that you're having to put together or is it like a movie for you i'd say it's more like a movie because i see these things vividly and and the books are all set in a familiar to me setting uh, i owned a farm many many years ago in appalachia a small farm and so abbott lives on the farm and his 
workshop is in my old barn and that he's redone. And, you know, all those things are very familiar to me. And the town is, uh, in fact, the, the general store that Della owned, I lived next door to. So it, they're so visual to me that it is like a movie. And I'll just, if I'm having trouble, I'll just close my eyes and, and see what I think they'll do next. And um, uh, so, yeah, more like a movie. I, I like that because, uh, you know, a lot of genres, it, it's very different writing styles. It's very, um, they have very sort of select styles that they use to put together their pieces. So it's, it's lovely to hear that for you it, it's a movie and uh, it's sort of easily, easily put together in your mind. Um, you know, it, it's not too much of bits and pieces. It's a smooth movie experience that allows you to, yeah, to, to understand and to, you know, allow yourself to become immersed in. Yeah, and you know, just I'd like to add another tip for your listeners, and, and that is that um, there's some, you, you just Google it, it, it's, there's some wonderful tips from screenwriters on yep. how to write novels. And I get most of my inspiration from screenwriters. I used to go to the movies all the time. And then the lockdown and all of that changed it. And I, 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 I have to admit, I don't think they're making very, very many movies for my uh, age bracket, I guess you'd say, or my sensibilities. But uh, I learned a lot by osmosis from watching really good right. television series, watching movies, studying what screenwriters do to draw the audience in. I can't think of a better inspiration. If you're ever stuck, just go rewatch your favorite movie and study it. How did they draw me in? How did they develop characters? How did they develop suspense? Um, great. I, I know that well, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a screenwriter, so I, I know the understanding of, of breaking it down and making sure that you're creating something that both you can visualize and a director can visualize. Because you're not really writing um, that scene for yourself. You're you're very much writing it for, for a lot of um, people. You know, you're writing it to give an experience. Um, so, you know, because you've, you've got to get the producers to like it and the, you've got to make sure the directors like it and the network of you know the network executives need to like it as well and, and yeah so uh, I get it I, I understand it's it's not easy to do so yeah screenwriters you know we they're about ticking boxes and uh, and I think that really translates into novel writing as well So is there a character that you've written that you would say has stuck with you the longest? Well, obviously Abbott, he, he seems like my son, you know, um, that I never had. So um, he's, uh, I, I probably mention him at least three or four times a week in conversation. I mean, he's just very much a, a part of my life, but um I think if I were to pick a favorite character that I do think of uh, often, it's um, Wallace Harding was in the, the uh, fourth book, the Murder Ballad Blues, and he is a real character. I mean, really a funny, unusual guy. And I don't know if you've ever watched Time Team. Do, do you know that television yeah, series? Yeah, I do, yeah. Well... He's, he's named after Phil Harding, who's one of the archaeologists. And um, I just, I, and he looked, when I described him, he looks like Mick Aston, who's one of the archaeologists. I'm a big fan of Time Team. And so that was my little tribute to, to those two characters that I think are just marvelous characters in real life. So I think about Wallace Harding from, 
you know, more often than the other characters I've created. That, that is actually really nice to know, because um, my mother was also a big fan of, of Time Team, so um, I had to watch it every Sunday with her, Sunday, late Sunday, <laughs> you know, just before all the soap operas would begin. She would have the uh, good old Time Team on, she'd be drawn into the uh, archaeology and she'd be excited about that, and then, yep, lo and behold, you know, be tough to have a really long spell of watching the show and then uh, we would end up watching the soap operas and, and closing out the night um, <laughs> that way so it's it's nice to actually hear that because I don't hear a lot of people talking about time team and and that kind of thing so it I think it's rare and it's nice to hear that it really is great, is there a character that you wish you could write more about Well, I guess I have been trying to figure out how to get Wallace Harding into this uh, Christmas novella, but I'm not sure I can. He's a very uh, specific character, and I don't, but I am trying to get him in there. Um, yeah. There's also a little boy that I wrote about in the Deep in the Forest who was in the the, um, uh, the New Forest. That's where that takes place, is in Hampshire in England. Yep. And his nickname is Baldy. His parents named him Archibald, and and that just wasn't a name a kid wanted to go by. And Baldy was better than Archibald. And he has an incredible arc in the book, as does Abbott. And um, I was thinking I'd like to have him come over, but the odds that this kid would get to make it to America is pretty slim so so I'm struggling with like how to have a legitimate uh, reprise of these characters and so maybe maybe they'll show up I, I would like to see I'd like to work with them again yeah like the director never... says I'd like to work with that actor again you know well I'd like to work with these characters again yeah I know I get that I I've seen that kind of strange transformation as well so um you never know like sometimes it just takes a spark and and that character's with you or you might even find a new one uh that you never thought about exploring because i know for me there's always characters people say oh well could you write more about this person and i'm like yeah if it ever comes to me <laughs> so what techniques have you found the most helpful was there ones and also, was there ones that you wish you hadn't attempted using? You mean writing techniques? Yeah. 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 Um, well, back in the day when I still listened to what other people said you must do, um, I did try to write with an outline and that didn't work for me. But like I said, I know it works for some folks. Um, I, I don't have the only thing, like a still regret I have, is that I didn't know a lot of these techniques when I started. So I struggled quite a bit with self-imposed assumptions. And, and if I could just mention a free resource, um, I wrote a memoir about my nephew here called Words and Books. And it's free. It's, it's on Amazon. And, and I, I just would love for people to get that because I put all of this down in, in writing, in stories, as well as some instruction. It yeah. was written for a business writing audience, but it works for fiction as well because the issues are just about the same. And I would love for people to know that they don't have to worry that they're not good enough let a boss tell them that you can't do something or whatever. Um, we've all had it happen to us. And, and this memoir of yours uh, might inspire them to go, you know, don't run it, I can do it too. And so I just mentioned it because it's free. I'm not trying to sell books, but just it's free. Feel free, because I mean, as I said, this is all about you and getting to know you and about your work. So I always say if you 
feel like one of your books might give them inspiration or help them on their journey, then always always mention it because you never know what might help someone. So moving into your life, now this is the part that everyone gets excited about because it's almost like they're getting to know the secrets behind the curtain. What is the first thing that you do when you want to de-stress from editing and writing, when you want to just close the door on it for the day and find a way to relax? Well, I love walking in nature and I'm lucky to live in California now where, oh, there's just beautiful parks. I live uh, very near the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and I, uh, I just go out and walk along. The, we have a beautiful waterfront here that's along a bay and there's all these marinas and, and some, it's not always sunny here. It's, uh, we get a good good amount of cloud, but when it's sunny and the water's sparkling and then we have huge redwood trees here that are, you know, 900 years old and huge. And I just can't, I mean, it, everything just sort of fades away because of the magnitude of that ocean and those big trees. And I have a little dog. I'm a real dog fanatic. There's lots of dogs in my book. And uh, I, I take her out and walk and walk and walk. And it's just it's a panacea for everything that might be bothering me. Yeah, well, look at that. What hobbies um, do you enjoy? And is there any that you wish you could explore more? Well, I mentioned gardening and cooking. And so... Yep. Uh, and I love to make things with my hands. I used to, when I lived in the mountains, I was a professional weaver and I earned my living yeah. as a weaver. And I, it, I, it, I did enjoy that, but it, boy, is that a hard way of life. And it is, it uh, is very hard. Yeah. Yeah. You have to go out and about and do all the marketing and that sort of thing. But, um, to answer your question about what I'd like to do more, I just discovered book art that is making books. And of course, they're not like books you read. They're, they're books of pictures or small pieces of art or um, I, I'm just beginning to explore it. And I did make one that is just recent. It's the first one I ever made. And uh, it's a lot of work, but it's a collection of all the dogs that have been in my life and it's just photographs and and little memories about them and boy it just turned out so pretty I, I'm really pleased with it and so I do want to spend more time there's a group here it's quite a big international group of book art but the trouble is I joined it in hoping I'm, I'm relatively new here I've, I've been here about 18 months and maybe not even that long and it's all been during lockdown or gradually crawling out of that. And so I've met very few people. So I joined the book arts group to think of thinking I would really enjoy meeting some of the people, but they only meet by Zoom. And I don't know about you, but I'm Zoomed out, out to my ears, you know. And so. Yeah, it, um, it gets boring after a while. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I will continue with that because I want to be conversant in the technique so that when they do hold Zoom workshops, it won't be Greek to me. I'll be able to. So yeah. that's what, partly why I made this book. And, um, oh, there's some lovely books on the book arts. And they really inspired me to try making them. And so, yeah, so that's where, what I'm looking at um, in the future. I think that's really awesome. Are you, well, you've, you've mentioned that you're a crafty person. Um, is there any crafts that you specifically do when you need to kind of clear the creative tubes out and get them moving again? You know, I'm, I'm such a perfectionist that I don't find the crafts all that relaxing. I, I find them worthwhile and I enjoy doing them when when the time is right, but I'm just so picky about how 
how it looks and everything, but I can't say I'm, um, that that relaxes me. If I, you know, I wish I had the talent to do watercolors or something like that, where, you know, you, not that that doesn't take a lot of talent and, and um, perfectionism perhaps, but just doing a wash of the paint and seeing how it blurs in with the, another color and all that, that appeals to me, but oh man, I cannot draw the face. Uh, so uh, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a craft that, other than cooking and gardening, but not a, a paper fabric, uh, that kind of craft that relaxes me. Yeah, no, I get that. I myself have a long-term illness known as idiopathic rheumatoid arthritis that makes me slow down and appreciate the day. What makes you smell the roses and slow down and just enjoy life? Um, well, just again, the being out in nature and um, just relaxing in the sunshine. And uh, I, I started the thing that I don't do it as much as I'd like, but I started a um, breakfast picnic. I'm a big picnicker. I love taking food out into the woods, and and I can't afford to eat out in a lot of restaurants, so. I take my food and go out, and um, and you know when I used to travel in England, uh, in England, I, I didn't get to. I went to Wales once, and I never made it to Scotland. But when I traveled to England, I would get such a kick out of seeing um, people pull their car over to the side of the road, get their little primus stones out, and make tea by the roadside. I mean, I just thought yeah. that was the most charming thing I've seen, and so. I, my picnics and um, I so I always had these lunch or dinner picnics and then it dawned on me I could have a breakfast picnic and so I take my little stove and I make pancakes and and eggs and coffee and and I start a little fire usually and and so I have two it's like having two burners and all that. well it's a lot of work so I don't do it as much as as I'd like but boy is that in the woods, it is. It's lovely. Relatively to do that. early in the day, hearing the birds and eating pancakes. That's good. That's life. That's that's what you call good life. That's, that's living it up. Yep. <laughs> What's your favorite place to curl up during the day? Is it like a garden, a cafe, reader's nook? Where do you like to go to just read? Well, I, I usually just read like in a comfortable chair or couch or something. But if I get to go out, you know, this doggone pandemic, um, I forgot. I mean, I, I love going to tea rooms or coffee shops and getting something and then, and then reading there too. That's a real pleasure. Okay. I, uh, I myself, it's uh, funny because I don't have a place at the moment to curl up in, so I'm busy trying to make a place that uh, feels comfortable and easy to lie in. And the last thing that we get to do today is we're going to play the word game. And this is a word association game, so I will read a word up and Linda will come back to me with a word in response. And uh, this is just designed to have a little bit of fun. And uh, at the end, I'll explain my choice of words so that Linda can uh, understand the idea that I had of where I might meet her if I happen to stumble across her one day. Um, and yeah, so it's just a little bit of fun. So the first word I have for you is flowers. Well, um... I guess impatience comes to mind. I think maybe you call them busy Lizzie. Um, uh, they're, they're a lovely flower and they grow easily. Yeah. yeah. What about trees? Well, 
I, I mean, these redwoods out here are just so fantastic. It's hard not to just immediately think of them. What about peaches? Well, I lived in Georgia a lot um, when I was younger, um, my, growing up with my family. And that's a, a state in the south of, of uh, the U.S. And um, so they're famous, Georgia peaches. They're famous for that. So I think of Georgia. What about plums? Not that kind of plums. Makes me think of prunes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like, okay. <laughs> what about cherries? Oh, I love cherries. They're just coming out here now. now. We're, we're having them now. And I think of cherry pie. <laughs> and last but not least, ice cream. For some reason I wrote, oh no, that's supposed to say iced tea. But my autocorrect kicked in. <laughs> oh, iced tea? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a very southern thing. Um, uh, you know, I grew, I mean, I sort of came of age in Atlanta, Georgia, and then I went to the mountains of North Carolina, and uh, iced tea is a very, I mean, it's just like water. I mean, it, it's just people drink iced tea, usually with a ton of sugar in it. So yes. that always, that pops to mind. And um, it's, you know, I love iced tea, but not, not the way they make it. So um, anyway, that's what comes to mind. So my words uh, was what I imagined in my head was that I was at this outdoor beautiful meadows picnic uh, for authors and we were in this beautiful place with this old sort of wooden house and all these authors were walking around and I sat down at a table and you were there and we, we ended up nibblings on bits of fruit and talking about books and that to me was like the perfect way to meet you in my mind. So, uh, well, let's that's do where it. The words came from. Let's do it. You come on out here. Well, I I have been them. out before. I was out in two thousand and sixteen. I was in L. A. Oh. So I am due to come back if I can uh, make it. Um, I think that's most of the key because every time I plan to come out, well, the pandemic just derailed it. So. Oh. But hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it in the near future. Oh, that's hopefully. that's our hope is to be back in LA because we have a lot of friends in LA. So, yeah, it would be oh, lovely to be out. But it has been fun. fantastic to have you on, and uh, I hope to have you back for when you have your next releases. Um, so please oh, keep okay. in touch. But yeah, it's been lovely having you on, guys. We've got some more exciting guests in the upcoming week. You are not going to want to miss it. We have Kathleen Fox, Virginia, Virginia McCullen, and Heidi McLannan. So you guys are not going to want to miss out in the upcoming weeks. So make sure you check back on Monday. But that is all for now.